democracies do not lead as 19th century liberals maintain to something like the French Revolution and to the chaos of the revolution. It leads to managerial control. The workers vote to be managed <laughs> and uh, the managerial class creates a science of administration or management and then proceeds to rule the people in the name of democracy. Very grateful to be joined today by Paul Gottfried, who has written a fantastic book called Anti-Fascism, The Course of a Crusade. Paul, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. Now, the first comment that really caught my eye in your book was that arousing a fear of fascism serves the interests of the powerful. Now, why is this? I think there, there seems to be consensus uh, certainly within the political class and the media, that fascism is the worst possible thing that could happen to us, that could befall a country, um, and that has become synonymous with whatever uh, the political establishment dislikes. So that, uh, you know, if uh, truckers are striking, they are fascist. Then I turn on Tucker Carlson and hear that the government of Canada is fascist. Um, I, I think what the term means is that the person speaking doesn't like the group that is protesting or the people who are objecting to the protest. So they're called fascists. Um, it's 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 simply a uh, sort of like the, the ultimate disparagement or term of disparagement, um, which perhaps has been at least partly replaced by the term racist or white supremacist in the United States. But they are the same. You know, if you're white supremacist, presumably you're also a fascist. It sounds in that sense, then, that it's part of what's commonly termed cancel culture. So you mm -hmm. can shut somebody down by calling them a transphobe, for example, mm -hmm. and equally and perhaps even more powerfully, you can do the same by shouting fascist. Right. Uh, curiously, uh, George Orwell, during the Second World War, as I point out in my book on anti-fascism, objected to the indiscriminate use of the term fascism. Remember, he was a left-wing socialist, and this was during the Second World War. And he said that, you know, for the sake of uh, a verbal honesty, you know, let, let's designate people who are fascist, fascist, and not call anybody else a fascist. Um, well, I, I think his warning went unheeded. Uh, and that term is now more indiscriminately, the F word is more indiscriminately used now than it was in 1943. <laughs> verbal <laughs> honesty is a nice phrase we'll get into more of that later on i think it's absolutely key there's a slipperiness to these terms that mm -hmm. shows the subversive way in which they are used you mentioned orwell there a uh, left-wing thinker and you say intriguingly and rarely for people nowadays sadly that you take your information or insights wherever you find them mm -hmm. who would you say are your biggest influences there are different people who have influenced me at, at different times. I'm 80 years old. So obviously the people who influenced me 50 years ago are not the ones who, you know, are the current influences. I would say that among those who influenced me were Aristotle, Hobbes, Hegel, Carl Schmitt, um, uh, and any number of, of other political thinkers. And then there's any number of great historians who have influenced me going all the way back to Thucydides, <laughs> um, Edward Gibbon, uh, all the great 19th century historians like uh, like Burkhart and uh, some of the great French historians of the period, definitely French sociology. Um, among living thinkers, those who influence me are usually included in my autobiographical book, Encounters. And uh, I was certainly influenced by uh, James Burnham, uh, Robert Nisbet, um, any number of other thinkers whom I mentioned in, in my uh, in my book, um, in, in my studies of fascism, I'm heavily influenced by Ernst Nolte, the uh, the German historian, whom unfortunately I never got to meet. But I read through most of his writings in German and was very much uh, impressed by his, especially by his early treatment of fascism when he was still sort of a recovering Marxist. Um, I am influenced by a number of interwar Marxists writing on, on fascism, um, and perhaps most recently, Stanley Payne, uh, who's sort of my mentor in fascism studies. Uh, I think he's the greatest living historian on the, uh, on the subject, certainly in the English language. There is a, a German historian of Nazism 
who is one of the most successful real estate brokers in Germany to name named Reinhard uh, Zittelmann, uh, who wrote a famous book on Hitler the Revolutionär. Hitler as a revolutionary. Um, I, I think he's a brilliant historian. <laughs> and uh, I've read his works on real estate, uh, being a real estate broker and so forth. I wish he had remained an historian of Nazism. But uh, these are only some of the many, many thinkers who have influenced my work over the years. It was a fascinating list and good to hear there are some Marxist thinkers in there as well. I think that shows an, an openness, as you say, to ideas wherever they might yes. be. Mm -hmm. You mentioned Burnham there and his concept of managerialism is an interesting mm -hmm. one. Tell me a little bit more about how that influenced you in particular, specifically well, it, the, the inevitability of elites. Right, right. If, if you read my book After Liberalism, um, it's heavily influenced by Burnham and also by Italian sociologists like Pareto, Musk and Pareto. And I'm really dealing with the circulation and inevitability of elites um, and pretty much uh, elaborating on Burnham's theory of, of, of managerial control. And the argument of that book is that um, the, the 19th century liberals were quite conservative by modern standards. They were not libertarians. You know, they were people who, they were people who believed in an established order like uh, Fitzjames Stevens, Leslie Stevens. There's others whom I quote as uh, Francois Guizot in France. The, these are 19th century liberals. Uh, and they believe in the, uh, the middle class as the classe capacitaire. I mean, these are the people who have the capability of running society. They generally opposed universal suffrage, manhood suffrage. Uh, they were only anti-clerical in Catholic countries. In Protestant countries, they were church-going, pretty much establishmentarian Protestants. And uh, they lose their power, of course, to, uh, to the laboring classes. Um, and by the early 20th century, you, you move into universal suffrage and governments call themselves democracies. Uh, and then they finally adopt what I think is, you know, the oxymoronic term uh, liberal democracy, which doesn't really mean very much to me. But the uh, democracies do not lead as 19th century liberals maintain to something like the French Revolution and to the chaos of the revolution. It leads to managerial control. The workers vote to be managed <laughs> and uh, the managerial class creates a science of administration or management and then proceeds to rule the people in the name of democracy, to give them a welfare state, to introduce social policy and so forth. And this pretty much fits, you know, Burnham's prediction of what was going to happen in the second half of the 20th century, uh, although it begins much earlier, it begins in the, early, in the late 19th, early 20th century. Um, and this is, this is exactly what does happen. Uh, and uh, what I argue is the term liberal has become a misnomer you know, for about a hundred years. Uh, and it keeps changing its meaning. Now liberal means somebody who favors uh, transgendering for children or uh, more rights to gays or Black Lives Matter. Uh, it has absolutely no relationship to what it meant in the 19th century. And, and a lot of my later work uh, has been based on the attempt to show the growing meaninglessness of inherited political terms. I first start with conservative and I show modern conservatives are not conservative in any sense. Uh, liberals are not, certainly are not liberal. Even Marxists are not Marxists anymore. So that the political vocabulary or lexicon of an earlier age has become obsolete, you know, in our time. Even the word democracy, of course, keeps changing. I mean, I have no idea how the British Tory party today has anything to do with the party of Disraeli, let alone <laughs> the, uh, the Tories of the 17th century you know, <laughs> who, who opposed, uh, you know, giving political rights to, to dissenting Protestants or something like that. I think a lot of people are wondering that. <laughs> There's certainly a lot of change, especially in the terminology. Mm -hmm. And it comes back to that point about verbal honesty right. you made earlier. Mm -hmm. And yet there are also elements that have been very much recycled. And you say that ideologies of the left, like communism and wokeism, recycle Christian elements. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, most people would think of them as being fundamentally opposed to all that's Christian. So how and why do you think they recycle Christian elements? Yeah, first of all, what I'm arguing is that Christianity is so embedded in Western civilization. It is the dominant religion for thousands of years. 
you know, it's not that people are just going to run away from it. Uh, they take it over in an heretical form or, you know, in some uh, form that is adapted to other, other political needs. And uh, certainly Christian universalism is present in wokeism. Um, it rejects the particular, it rejects the national, right? And I think that you know, this, this goes back to the Pauline epistles. Um, you know, we're all one in Christ, men, women, Greeks, Jews, and so forth. So there, there, there is the element of Christian universalism. And also, uh, although it is greatly transformed, the element of equality, I think, is essentially Christian. Uh, even if you you know you have an organic hierarchical structure, which the uh, the uh, medieval Christians take over from the Romans and use Aristotelian arguments to defend, uh, I think we would agree that the the idea that that all, that we all have a common humanity, have souls, and so forth, is essentially Christian or Judeo Christian. I think the the woke left borrows these elements. Though I'm not saying that Christianity and wokeism are the same, and some people think I am saying this. I, I am not. I do not accept the view that Christianity is the Bolshevism of antiquity and so forth. What I, uh, I think was Spengler said that. But what, what I am arguing is that because of the, of the durability of Christianity, because it does create the underlying cultural moral structure of the West, that, that movements that succeed have to borrow from Christianity. Uh, something like Nazism is clearly anti-Christian. Right, or neo neo pagan, or something like that. Mm. Whereas in wokeism and Marxism, you can see elements, and generally in the left, you can see elements uh, transformed elements of Christianity. That that is what I argue. Right, and this is an argument made by Vergelin as well that religious motifs go into right. modern totalitarian politics. Yeah, I forgot to mention that that I've been heavily influenced by uh, by Jonas and Vergelin and other German writers on uh, on Gnosticism and how it plays out as political ideology. And I think the point you made about equality there was a really fundamental one, because a leftist really can't be too committed to equality. It's the defining characteristic insofar as there is one on the left. Mm -hmm. And yet the transcendent basis for it in Christian thought disappears when it's recycled by the left. Mm -hmm. There's no ground for the equality in the image of God that all human beings mm -hmm. share. And we get this sense that a utopia, a heaven, can be brought down onto earth. So there's the same kind of Christian framework and yet no fundamental support for it. Right. But, you know, in, in some ways, it's similar to fascism because fascism tries to recycle conservative themes, but does it in a kind of revolutionary way. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the uh, the Council of Elders or whatever the, they create, uh, you know, is supposed to resemble some medieval or, or uh, maybe counter-revolutionary aristocratic body. But of course, it's not. <laughs> they simply take over terms and they throw in some kind of Roman terminology and so forth. They borrow selectively you know, from older traditions. And I think this is true of, uh, of wokeism as well. You've got this concept, political religion, and this is probably a good place to introduce it, given what you mm -hmm. just said there. You say that political religion harks back to its leftist precursors in the French and Russian revolutions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What exactly is political religion? And what has it got to do with the French and Russian revolutions? All... Um, uh, leftist ideology seems to re rest on some kind of transformational myth that we can totally change human nature uh, by introducing a revolutionary government that will break from the past. It will reconstruct culture, reconstruct society uh, together with human beings. Um, and certainly the French Revolution does this. I mean, it tries to uh, give days new, new names. It creates a, non -cre a, a revolutionary liturgical calendar um, and the Russian Revolution breaks even more because it, you know, it abolishes uh, uh, private ownership of the means of production and so forth. And also, like the French Revolution, it creates a dictatorship, but a much harsher one uh, that lasts for much longer. Um, but I think the belief that, that human nature can be changed uh, according to a progressive vision of the world um, and a, a revolutionary government will try to uh, reconstruct society and humanity. Uh, and in the end, of course, they're all universal because, the, you know, the, the revolution will start in one country, but 
what it will eventually become, uh, you know, sera du jeune homme. It becomes the entire human race. So I think I think they all share that. Um, and I, I I think all almost all ideologies are by nature leftist. Um, I wrote an introduction in one of Kenneth Minogue's books in which I point that out that you know to to the fact that he equates communism with ideology is not entirely wrong because ideology is by its nature leftist. Now, there are non-leftist ideologies, <clears throat> um, one of them, of course, being fascism, which I would argue is, is, is a rightist imitation of a leftist ideology, to quote Ernst Nolte. But, but ideologies have generally been on, been on the left, and they're all based on a transformational myth and a project of changing human nature, uh, changing human nature to make it authentic. Because as the woke left tells us, people are not authentic today, right? I mean, they're forced, they're forced into false identities. So the, uh, the success of the political ideology will be seen in whether, you know, we can recover human nature as it actually, or the, or the nature of each one of us in an authentic way. Speaking of projects to try to transform human nature and restructure society, the Frankfurt School is often mentioned mm. in that connection. And people see that as the root of much of the cultural subversion that we see around us in the West at the moment. And you point out rightly, I think, that the Frankfurt School flourished more in the United States mm -hmm. than it had in interwar Germany. And uh, many of its core ideas about combating prejudice <laughs> and the authoritarian personality became so profoundly Americanized that they informed American concepts of democracy. I think that is a perspective that people don't often hear, the idea that the Frankfurt School is in some sense homegrown in the US. How did that happen and why? Well, I, I've, I argue this in several of my books. Now, it's interesting you raised this point because my, uh, my editor, acquisition editor, <clears throat> asked me to write this book for Cornell uh, in NIU Press. They're sort of, they've merged now. She found that idea absolutely uh, unsettling and not entirely convincing. She says, you know, isn't this a German thing? Uh, and I said, well, you know, from, and then after 1933, it became an American thing. Mm. Uh, these people moved here and uh, they, you know, they were based in New York. Columbia University set up a special thing um, for the, uh, the Institute for Social Research for Sozial Forschung and uh, next to Columbia University. It came out sort of integrated into the university. And, and many of these people end up practicing psychiatry or psychology in New York. I mean, er Eric Fromm is one of the most radical members of the Frankfurt School who uh, enjoys enormous success in the United States. Karen Harney, there, there are other, other, other members of this, uh, of this group. And uh, I, I, I remember reacting strongly to a statement in uh, Alan Bloom's book on um, the, uh, the closing of the American mind, which speaks about how the Germans' uh, uh, foreign ideas were brought over here and corrupted us. Well, in the case of the Frankfurt School, most of the corruption set in here. And then after the war, we moved them back in 1950 to Frankfurt. And, uh, you know, they had tremendous influence on re-educating Germans, you know, and turning them into the basket cases they've become. One of the reasons it's well established in the United States is because the idea of democratic social engineering takes root in the United States in the early 20th century, right? It goes back to the progressive era. You know, you have people like uh, Seema Martin Lipset, this, this uh, Cold War liberal sociologist who absolutely loves the authoritarian personality, which is published in the United States in English, you know, um, in 1950. So he thinks that this is a great work. It's just that Adorno and Horkheim were not sufficiently aware that communists could also have authoritarian personalities. They were just talking about fascism. Uh, so, you know, the, the, the Americans can make their peace with this. The only thing they didn't like about the Frankfurt School was that some of its members were very sympathetic to communism, you know, and they got dragged before the House on American Activities Committee and so forth. But at the same time, they did enjoy a great vogue among, you know, within the American Academy and they, they leave their mark on what becomes the fascist scale that is used in the United States uh, in testing people for civil service and education. There's a fascism scale that is introduced in the 1950s. Then, then it gets up, uh, updated in the 1970s. Uh, you know, and basically, they're testing people 
to make sure they don't have dangerous right-wing personalities. Uh, now, this was being done throughout the anti-communist period of the Cold War, <laughs> which people sometimes are not aware of. Um, and at least liberal anti-communists were not, you know, were not opposed to this because they saw the communist as, you know, the as red fascist, essentially, as I argue. So uh, the Frankfurt School became, you know, quickly very, uh, I'm thinking in German, das war, sie wurden das war eingebürgert. They became like uh, domesticated or <laughs> Americanized. And of course, during the Second World War, they were very important because they were all working um you know, to uncover fascist personalities so that we could fight the fascists in Europe. Uh, the idea that somehow, that, you know, that this is extraneous to the United States, I think, is uh, a very, for me, a very unconvincing argument. What would you say is the clearest flowering of that tradition today, beyond obviously the use of fascism as a term designed to stamp out debate on particular topics? Well, I, I think what happens in the second generation of the Frankfurt School, which is more radical, the one the one that goes back in, in Germany, people like Habermas are typical of that second generation. They're much more radical in some ways. They not only you know buy into the anti-capitalist socialist argument, and they're not only interested in reconstructing the family. In Germany, they're very anti-nationalist. They're fanatically anti-German. Uh, they're the people who are now in power. You know, you see the influence of the second generation of the Frankfurt School. The second generation is also open to LGBT. The first generation, I argue, my book is really not. I mean, they they favor tolerance for gays, you know, and they think women should be in professions and so forth. They're not really that radical. I mean, as I say, they're somewhere to the right of, of what in America is the conservative movement right now, you know, but they're, <laughs> <laughs> they're not that, believe me, um, Herbert Marcuse was my professor <laughs> and uh, 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 he looked upon feminism, he looked askance at feminism, you know, <laughs> even if he defended the Soviet Union and didn't think Stalin was a bad fellow, but he was, uh, he was very upset by, and I'm sure he would have been absolutely uh, unsettled by the presence of gays. But but I, th I think it's the second generation that is much more radical. I also don't think they're quite as anti, -so they're not as, as anti-capitalist or socialist, but they're into social engineering, you know, and uh, uh, into gay rights and so forth. This is much more characteristic, you know, of the people who come to the United States. And then the Frankfurt School that is reestablished in Germany, particularly under Adorno, not so much Horkheimer in the 1950s. One of the strains of thought in the Frankfurt School is the idea that culture is important. For the mm -hmm. classical Marxist, it was all about economics, but after that failed, culture was seen as important. And you say that we are witnessing with our movies and their reshaping of popular culture, mm -hmm. a subversion of civilization itself. What trends have you noticed there? Well, I mean, if you turn on American television, you notice that all you have are blacks. Uh, occasionally, you see whites, but they're married to blacks, homosexuals, a transgender people. Uh, we are we are not going to renewing our cable TV. <laughs> I can't watch this. Um, I'd much rather listen to classical music or do something like that. Um, uh, but it's it's obvious that the entire entertainment industry has been occupied by woke by wokeness. <laughs> Uh, there's nothing else. And, you know, you get it. I, I, th I think, though, it's overkill. And I think there is going to be a reaction. Uh, I mean, even if you turn on advertisements, you don't see any white people. And you see lots of gay couples. One of the most important features, I think, of wokeism is that corporate capitalism is behind it. The stupid idea you hear on Fox News all the time, it's simply untrue. These are not classical Marxists or any kind of Marxists. Uh, they're cultural radicals, but occasionally they claim to be Marxist. One of the major criticisms the left makes of my work, uh, and by the way, the left takes my work much more seriously than the conservative movement, which will never even review me. Uh, they hate me, but the left will take me seriously, um, and they're angry that I that I argue they're not Marxist. Uh, <laughs> this is their major gripe. I mean, beside the fact that I'm a fascist and a racist and a Nazi and so forth, but I do not recognize them as Marxists. And of course, they're not Marxists. They take all their money from corporate capitalism. The question to me is, why are corporate capitalists behind Black Lives Matter? 
you know, which is blowing up building shooting policemen. What interest do corporate capitalists have in this or the electronic media? I'm not quite sure, you know, what the connection is, uh, but there is a connection. I think you see the, the, the ideas, the radical ideas, particularly of the second generation of the Frankfurt School, uh, which are certainly present in American and European culture. <clears throat> you mentioned there that the left take your work more seriously than the right do. The right won't even review your books. No, no, now, no. Most people think of cancel culture as being something that comes primarily from the left, but you've, you've argued and also you have yourself experienced how some of the worst mm. purges can actually come from the right. Why do you think this is? Well, first, first of all, the right is not very smart. I think even now, most of the intelligent people are on the left, however crazy the left may, may be. Uh, most people in the conservative movement, I've argued in my book on the conservative movement, uh, seem to be sort of cognitively challenged communist, you know, from the 1930s or 19. They're not very bright. They just follow the leader. Uh, there's slogans every day that they recite and so forth. Um, but the, uh, the, 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 the conservative movement is extremely centralized and authoritarian in the United States. And you're not supposed to disagree with them. And, you know, I was sort of an up and coming conservative intellectual into the 1980s um, when I did not go along with the neoconservative takeover of the movement. Thereafter, I was called an anti-Semite, a racist, every, although my family were, you know, Central European refugees from the Nazi. That doesn't make any difference. Um, I was all these things. Um, uh, and then, you know, in, in, this, in, in this, this infamous incident, uh, in which I was uh, kept from a graduate professorship in classics at um, Catholic University of America, all these conservative luminaries came in to attack me and called up the dean and uh, said bad things about me. Um, the reason was that I had basically written, I'd written a number of places attacking the neoconservative foreign, global democratic foreign policy. You're not supposed to do that. And uh, you know, I generally have not accepted conservative party lines. Therefore, I'm a bad person. Uh, they've canceled me wherever they can. Um, I worked uh, at a university with leftist colleagues. Um, I wrote for Marxist magazines, <laughs> which did let me write for them. You see, the conservatives mm -hmm. would not. Uh, so when conservatives say that we're fighting cancel culture, they're lying through their teeth. They're worse than anyone on the left. This has been my experience. Um and, you know, I'm all in favor of fighting cancel culture, but let's get people who favor intellectual freedom on our side. And the conservative movement definitely does not. Um, uh, and, you know, this fight has been going on with me for 40 years. Uh, and they really work hard to make sure my name never comes up. Uh, they never review my books, although they win prizes, they're translated and so forth. And the only people who've taken me seriously are Marxists. And dissenting conservatives, like paleo conservatives, with whom I am now grouped, but the uh, the conservative, what I call the conservative establishment, dislikes me much more than anyone on the left. Um, so their claim to be for tolerance, I think, is totally empty. I don't think any of these people seriously. Um, and I, I think we have to reconstruct the conservative movement around a principle of freedom and to with tolerance, which it, and by the way, the conservative movement starts out in the 1950s this way. Um, it is never tolerant. Uh, it is uh, screamingly anti-communist. Uh, it is proud of the fact that it does not favor intellectual tolerance. And then it gets taken over by neoconservatives who are among the most intolerant human beings I've ever met. So uh, the conservative movement has a record on how the post-war conservative movement that's every bit as bad as that of the left, which it attacks. Powerfully put. And I think people have seen on social media examples of this gatekeeping being exhibited by right. so-called right-wing thinkers. What do you think is the main threat you pose? Why not just address your arguments openly and attempt to answer them honestly? I, I have no idea why they hate me so much. I am not a white nationalist. I, how do they ever write about the subject of race? I am not anti-Israeli. I have a son-in-law who's an Israeli. I, I don't know why they hate me so much, but they do. Mm -hmm. And I, I think I think this may be attributable to the fact that I've never gone along with party lines. Like uh, sometime in the 1980s, they went from saying that Martin Luther King was a communist uh, philanderer and so forth to turning him into a conservative Christian theologian 
for whom we must set aside one day a year. And I said, you know, they may have exaggerated <laughs> one direction earlier. Now they're going all, and then everybody takes over the new party line. You know, the uh, the communists actually had people leaving the party dur- during the Soviet Nazi pact. You know, they said, how can you do this? You know, Hitler was bad, now he's good. You know, this is, this is, but conservatives would have gone along with that, the rank and file. They will buy into anything, most of these people. Um, and, you know, I, 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 have, I have a friend who... Uh, who died a few years ago? We were colleagues, and he would ne- he would listen to Republican news channels all day. And he'd oh, I, I said I, I can guess what you're going to say today, and I could. <laughs> I knew what the party line was, <laughs> so that that's why they do not like me. It's not because I'm a fascist or a racist or anything or anti-Israeli or whatever they say. It's because I disagree with them, and you know I think there are a lot of people who get canceled who are on the right who are not neo-Nazis or any of these things. They just disagree with their party lines. And once you um, disagree with them, you got totally canceled. They're much more thorough than the left is. You disappear, you know. Uh, They drop you down a memory hole. I've pointed out again and again, if they try to buy me off, they probably could have done this, you know, 40 years ago. I had five kids, you know. I had to pay for a house. You know, you want to, uh, I'd be nice. I'd avoid certain subjects. But what they did was they went to war against me. Sounds like people on the right with a spine are being eliminated. And right. perhaps this right. is why we see such a weak response from the right to mm-hmm. today's problems. You say that the the new intersectional left operates like a runaway train, conceding mm-hmm. any ground to the left will not cause it to stop roaring forward. And yet that continually over the last few decades has been exactly what the right has done. Concede ground, concede ground. Yeah, yeah. No, that's exactly what what I've argued. Um, You know, when are you going to stop? I mean, I turn on Fox News. um, I see black gays. uh, I see, you know, lesbians arguing for conservative transgendered rights. (laughs) I mean, how far are you going to go to see the other side? (laughs) And, uh, you know, I, I said that, you know, th- th- this is the late coming, the late coming left in the, in the sense that uh, uh, they take over what the leftist positions were 10 years ago or 20 years ago, and they call it conservatism. Mm. And they keep doing this. But of course, you're seeding ground all along the way. So <laughs> the question is, when are you going to stop and when are you going to develop a spine? What's the assumption in the response from the right there. Why assume that appeasement is going to work? Or do you think that they're genuinely just sympathetic to the left beneath it all? I think some are in fact sympathetic to the left because they, you know, they grew up and they were uh, acculturated, you know, by the left. They went to Ivy League schools and this. I mean, I have five kids; uh, they're all adults, and most of them are leftists. You know, and they think I'm I'm just crazy. Uh, and I think that the conservative movement simply represents a more moderate left, but does not want to recognize, you know, the fact that it's it has nothing in common with the conservatism of the 1950s, except for intolerance. They remained equally more intolerant or become more intolerant than they were back then. Uh, so I think that's part of it. Uh, another part, I think, of why they have become this way is they want mainstream acceptability. They don't want you to call them racist. You know, I hear these people on TV, uh, these conservatives, um, I'm not a racist, am I? You've got a black person to say that you're not a racist. You feel better. Um, these people really have no spine. <laughs> you, know, you, want, uh, the, you know, there's there's no, no reason to say this. Or, you know, they lie about the civil rights movement. The civil rights movement was all good. And suddenly things became bad around 19, about 2005 or 2006. Well, you know, things have been going in this direction a long time, I argue in my books. And to say that it was OK until five or 10 years ago, I think, is to mistake the problem. What do you think is the fundamental mistake that has been made by the right here at the outset? Yeah, um, I think. One mistake is the intolerance and the the obsessive anti-communism that I remember just sort of reading past when I used to read National Review in the 1960s or 70s. You know, these were good writers, but, you know, why are they so obsessed? Of course, many were recovering communists who became Mm. fanatical anti-communists, but remained as totalitarian as they were before. Mm. I think that's uh, that's part of the problem. And they start there as they start purging people from the beginning. 
I, I was purged, but they started purging people back in the 1950s, some of whom I knew <laughs> Uh, because they opposed their foreign policy or they weren't anti-communist enough or something like that. So, so the intolerance is in their blood. Um, and the neoconservatives are far more fanatical and far more paranoid than paranoid than the, than the first generation were. So I, I think this is a problem. Then, then um, you know, they, they just decided they were going to move left uh, on, on everything in order to stay, you know, part of the political conversation so what they do is they begin cutting off people who are on the right who dissent, just as they were cutting off people earlier who were not anti-communist enough. Uh, so I, I, I think I think the entire what I call media conservatism today is utterly corrupt. Uh, I think that it must be uh, pushed aside, and some new movement must be created um, if we want a serious right that will take on the left and fight leftist intolerance. Now, there are some people there, I'm sure, who are perfectly decent, who are simply sucked into the system. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a controlled conversation with too much gatekeeping. Uh, and they lie about the past all the time. Um, and, you know, as we used to joke, the, at the end of the day, what, they agree with the leftist understanding of American history. We used to be racist, sexist, all these things, but we're okay now. You know, we, we sort of got it right. So you have to support our side. Well, they pretty much accept the left's view of the American past, as far as I can see. Um, and I, I think they have to move away from that habit. Uh, uh, and they have, you know, they, have, they and I think they also have to understand the United States is a constitutional republic. Uh, it is not a global democracy. Uh, it is not based on human rights. It is based on historical liberties that are <laughs> embedded. And of course, most of them go back to England anyhow. Uh, and, you know, that, that is the way we should understand. It. I think it may be too late for that. Too many bridges have been uh, broken or <laughs> we've moved past them. So and of course, our mother country, England, <laughs> seems to be in even worse shape than we are. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. The remark you made about the leftists getting upset when you say that they're not Marxists was really fascinating. You say that the intersectional left and its anti-fascism are more radical than any Marxist left that <clears throat> preceded right. it. Right. What makes the intersectional left and its anti-fascism more radical? Well, because it's not just interested in changing the economic system, uh, you know, which would be bad enough I mean, to live in a communist country, <clears throat> or, or I, you know, even the, even the England of, of Clement Attlee would not please me very much. <clears throat> but, you know, th th these people want to totally reconstruct human nature in a way that, in a nihilistic fashion, because they totally reject any kind of fixed human nature, which mm. they view as fascist. If I say they're men or women, this is fascist, because fascists believe in fixed identities. Uh, so what they want to do is simply de destroy all human relations as they have hitherto existed. This goes well beyond anything the communists ever tried. So I think, I think they're even more radical. Um, they're certainly more radical than Marx you know, who had very traditional taste in music, literature, everything else. These people, these people were leaving cancel culture. Uh, so, you know, so uh, they wouldn't give you even a, a Bolshoi ballet. I mean, you wouldn't get anything with them. <laughs> but, you know, a constant can canceling people, you know, until they get, you know, the, the form of radicalism, social cultural radicalism that they want. If the emphasis is on this radical liberal autonomy, then even the idea of having a sex, male or female, is seen as restrictive and stifling that. Yeah, it's interesting that uh, the Washington Post and uh, the, the English Guardian have attacked uh, Viktor Orban in Hungary because he insisted that children be registered as male or female at birth. <laughs> and they said, this shows he's a fascist. <laughs> <laughs> and you cannot believe the things you're reading. You know, and I mentioned this in my book. <laughs> you can't believe the things you're reading. Um, now, I'm sure that Fox News will say there are no fixed genders in about a week, you know, to catch up to the left. Then they'll, you know, find some other point to distinguish themselves over, uh, like, intervening against Putin or something like that. <laughs> We've got this great tension emerging then between <clears throat> Burnham's managerial class of elites and then the average person, the populist movement, because increasingly almost everybody's going to be called a fascist, aren't they? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
you know, almost almost every the, the one group, by the way, that they always spare are communists. You, you know, the fact that communists are homophobes or racist doesn't matter at all. They still admire them. They see the communists as their intellectual moral progenitors, you know, so they the woke left. So they they always say good things about, about the communists. Um but you know, I suppose everybody else is sort of open to cancellation, you know, at this. And the communists are usually dead, so they don't matter. But it, you know, people who are alive, you know, are, are canceled. I, <clears throat> I I thought it was interesting. The city of Berlin, uh, under some radical leftist government now, is going to rename streets. Now, they started by removing the names of people who were Nazi party members, this was years ago. Then they went on to people who were serving the German army. Now they're removing Konrad Adenauer, because uh, he allowed former Nazi members in his government. Of course, the reason they're going after him is he was anti-communist. Anyone who's anti-communist is being is being canceled. Uh, so this is uh, what the Germans call ein, ein, ein Umbenennungsversuch, uh, renaming uh, effort. So this goes on and on, but pretty soon everyone's going to be canceled except maybe Rosa Luxemburg and uh, <laughs> a few transgendered <laughs> will have streets named for them there. It just goes on and on. You know, it never ends. <laughs> so would you say that the primary divide here is between left and right or is it between the elites and populism? <clears throat> I, I would say it's both. I would say that. The um, the people at the bottom, actually in America, the white working class is conservative. The elites are radical. And as my uh, young colleagues, my uh, associate editor wrote in an article, we now see the counter revolution of the left, right? Because the left are the ones who are in power. And what you saw in the summer of love was the, uh, the, the leftist elite striking back. Um, against the poor working class and shop owners, you know the rule. The ruling class is the woke left, and the people who go to church and have gender distinctions and so forth. Those are members of the working class. We call her the basket of deplorables. Remember Hillary Clinton's? <laughs> I live among deplorables. All my neighbors had Trump signs and so forth. I do not want to live in a large city among intellectuals. <laughs> the effort required to maintain this, the control of language required, the verbal mm -hmm. dishonesty is immense. And you say that terms have come to mean what journalists, politicians, and academics right. say they mean. Mm -hmm. Why is that? And why does it matter? Well, it's because these are the people who rule over us. They control the media. Uh, in a place like Germany, they shape the electorate. The, the Germans being Germans and not Italians or something will vote the way they're, the people in charge tell them. They, they, they'll they follow authority. So they vote for these crazy green leftists and party of the left and the social Democrats who, you know, uh, favor all kinds of radical social experiments uh, because they, you know, they look up to people who are in authority. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, once you get into positions of authority and the, the media and the electronic media particularly have tremendous power over us. They define what words mean. There's again, there's a German term, Deutungshoheit, which is you know the high the high point from which you determine meaning. Conservatives use this term to describe what's going on, and these people control what words mean, uh, and they change. Like you know, you could use the N word uh, if we're making a movie. Like you know, you, what you go you watch Tarantino movies, they're full of black swearing at each other, and whites using these terms. Then at a certain point, this becomes the worst crime against humanity, you know, and then, of course, it's used selectively because people on the left can say anything they want. But then you notice that Joe Rogan, who was a Bernie Sanders supporter, by the way, uh, had somebody on who was, you know, against uh, the mandates and the vaccine mandates. So they cancel him <clears throat> and he's attacked for having used the N word, I don't know, 15 years ago or 10 years ago or something like that. Well, I mean, leftists can do it anytime they want because they're on the left. You know, they can they can use the word fag for homosexual. Nobody cares. You know, they, they get excused when they do it. These language pro, linguistic prohibitions are enforced very selectively. You know, they're used against people whom you want to cancel. Occasionally, they use it against people on the left who occupy lower positions in their hierarchy. You know, they don't count. So they make an example of them. <clears throat> but you know, uh, people who uh, have popular black uh, um, 
black leftists who uh, are in positions of power or the people who have television programs, you know, uh, like The View, they can pretty much, uh, Whoopi Goldberg made some comment about the Holocaust that I wrote on. And uh, I don't know if you saw my piece saying she was not just attacking Jews, she was attacking all white people, saying, mm-hmm. I don't even care, you know, if these white people kill each other. <laughs> Well, I think they suspended her for a week. She was really angry. And then all these people, you know, on CNN were saying, how dare you do this? You could just imagine if, uh, you know, if even one of these lame conservatives on Fox News were to say this, uh, <laughs> that person would never be allowed. They probably have to remove him, you know, from Fox News and so forth. So uh, there is a double standard in how the uh, these prohibitions are applied. The point you made about Rogan being a Sanders supporter is interesting because the fact that Rogan is presented as right wing in current media is very revealing mm-hmm. because he's not really all that right wing at all no. when he happens to like hunting, but that's about it. Right. Yeah, that's right. I mean, uh, <clears throat> I don't think he's ever expressed right wing views, <laughs> uh, but, he, but he does try to interesting people on his interview program. <clears throat> yeah. You don't hold out much hope it seems for being able to reform any of this you say that one can only address their duplicity and suppression of free speech by creating alternative media and then urging our friends to shun their tainted services there is no other way forward so what practical steps would you advise then because i think there's growing frustration about this people (coughs) recognize that there really is no other way forward Mm -hmm. well I, i i think we do have alternative media in the United States. Now, most of the people who, put, you know, who cre- have created this um, are not, you know, hard right-wing people. Uh, they're typically, you know, Fox News personalities. But, you know, uh, we use them. Our magazine uses them. They don't, you know, they're, they're quite happy to, uh, to let us stay there. <clears throat> um, but I, I think alternatives do have to be created. Um, and, you know, I, I think if... Uh, Twitter and uh, Facebook and others would lose 50 percent, you know, of their users. uh, This would definitely have an effect on them. I think they'd have to alter their policies. Um, I think the Democrats in the United States will take one hell of a beating in November. Uh, The problem is I don't trust the Republicans at all. (laughs) I don't think they'll make they're like they're like the British, the wet conservatives in England. I don't trust them. Um, But, you know, at, at least. For the time being, the really crazy left will be replaced by uh, the weak need conservatives, uh, which I think is an improvement. I mean, probably Boris Johnson is a bit better than what you have waiting for you in the Labour Party in England. <clears throat> so uh, I, I think in the end, the way the left will be brought down um, is through an internal disunity. This is what I argue. The elements that make up this left are so crazy <laughs> and so contradictory that I have no idea, you know, how this coalition can stay together forever. <clears throat> um, uh, I mean, really, what do Muslim fundamentalists have in common with, uh, with lesbians? Or what do black nationalists have in common with transgendered? I mean, look at the, you know, the groups within this alliance. I have no, I, I think it is going to break up. Now, I hope it breaks up before they've destroyed everything. I think the only way that these these corporate capitalist radicals can be controlled is through mass boycotts, mm. organized boycotts. The conservative movement will not do this because that would be too radical. They're always saying we shouldn't do this. Well, the left does this all the time. You know, for the right, if you want to do this, you're a radical and they won't talk to you. These are the the, the limited measures I think we can use. Uh, at the end of the day, what what is going to change the situation uh, is that the left just falls apart. Um, which I think it will do eventually. The question is when. And will there, will there be anything left on the other side you know, to pick up the, the pieces? A tempered optimism there then. In the long run, you're optimistic, but in the short term, <laughs> perhaps things will get worse before right. they get better. Where can people find out more about your work? I've written 15 books and probably hundreds of articles. And uh, there's lots of stuff. I've published stuff in German, even some stuff in French. <laughs> So, uh, you know, there, there's lo- lots of my work around for the conservative movement to ignore, <laughs> <laughs> which it does very well, by the way. <laughs> well, hopefully this will direct some more people to your fascinating mm-hmm. insights. I'll put the links in the video description for people to find. Mm-hmm. Well, thanks so much for your time. And okay, and thank you for having me. Right. You're welcome.